Hi, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chris. Glad to be here today from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, welcome to all of you who've joined us today. Happy Easter. And thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us and learning more about fundraising with Kevin today. So I thought we'd start with a prayer. So if we could just close our eyes, take a deep breath or two and invite the Holy Spirit in to join us today. So we begin with the third letter um, from St. John. Nothing gives me greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, you are faithful in all you do for the brothers, especially for strangers. They have testified to your love before the church. Please help them in a way worthy of God to continue their journey. For they have set out for the sake of the name and are accepting nothing from pagans. Therefore, we ought to support such persons so that we may be co-workers with the truth. We pray, Holy Spirit, to guide us, guide our conversation and our the message that we'll hear today about money, about fundraising, and about how to take care of our young people. Amen. So our webinar presenter today is Kevin Fine. Kevin is the Director of, of Youth and Young Adult Ministry for the Archdiocese of Dubuque. In addition to that role in the Archdiocese, Kevin serves as the Board Treasurer for the National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministry, of course, who is hosting this today. Um, I also know Kevin from Ministry Days back in Appleton, Wisconsin. So it's like being with an old friend today, and I know we're going to learn a lot and have a lot of fun too. So welcome, Kevin. We're looking forward to today. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, looking at the attendee list, uh, greetings to everyone from the Archdiocese of Dubuque. Thanks for jumping onto this call. Greetings to everybody from Region 9. Good to be seen by you if I can't see you. But anyway, it's good to be with friends. Um, this is uh, going to be interesting. I. I love this question is uh, just starting with the presentation, like what, who's this guy and why should we care about what he has to say at all? And that's a legitimate question. And research shows, right, that we have to be very careful about starting any presentation with young people, investing in a relationship of trust and um, all, all that all that kind of stuff. So, so building um, building those those networks and, and relationships with young people. So why should you trust me? That's, that's a good question. And I frankly, I'm not sure that everything I say is gonna be right. So I just wanna put that on the table and say, yeah, some of the stuff might work for you and some of it won't. And I think that's a good good spot. But but here's the angle I'm coming from. So I've, I've got 25 years of youth ministry experience doing all kinds of programs from uh, World Youth Day to uh, NCYC, which I'll talk about a bit later, to um, other small things that are in a pair setting and out the diocesan setting. Um, here's a picture of me in Colorado doing a, a trip with young people where we go out and it's, it's like a kumbaya boot camp. We uh, take them out to Colorado and challenge them. Um, and it's an expensive trip and we, we have to have money for that. So that's something I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I raised funds for that program a little bit later. Um, and this is me with my financial accountability uh, program. So uh, this is my buddy in, in crime here at the Archdiocese. And uh, this is how we do accounting. We just take a picture of the money and we figure the bank and sort it out. But this is after one of our events, we took a collection to make ends meet. And um, and you can see from there that we gathered about $1,192 or so. So anyway, um, so I've done programs. I've handled cash. Um, that's my expertise. But but here's the, uh, the claim to fame for the Archdiocese of Dubuque is that we have a significantly large traveling delegation to NCYC. So this is a mosaic from 2019, uh, where, um, or 2017, and they all blend together to me. But you see all the little pixels are different people who went. So like we've had uh, as much as 1500 people go to our, to uh, from our delegation, from our diocese have traveled with us to NCYC. Um, it's a big deal. So that doesn't happen on accident. And so there's some lessons we've learned from that. But but my expertise on fundraising is not because I've necessarily had a lot of proven success with it, but I have interactions with a lot of parish youth ministry leaders who do have a lot of different stories to tell, a lot of different experiences, um, some that are awesome and successful, and some that we laugh at today. So like those are the stories that I'm going to bring um, to share with you. So, so very basically, what, what I'm hoping to do today is, is talk about this question about why do we fundraise at all, share some of the collective wisdom that I've heard from other people or that I've observed in my years of ministry, and then to share some real practical suggestions. That's always one of the things people are looking for is what can I really do? Some of these are going to be great practical suggestions, and some I hope you laugh at, um, and some of them you will probably have planned for a week from now, and you're still going to laugh at it, but anyway, let's move forward. Um, I, 
I will offer an opportunity too in the chat later for people to share some ideas, thoughts, what's worked for you, what's frustrated you. So be ready for that when it comes. Um, find the chat button, get ready to cue it in. If you want to throw in a question at any time, I've got those up. If it's pertinent and I can, I can pause and move to it, I'll go ahead and direct it in real time. Otherwise, Jane will be facilitating those for us uh, later on. Okay, so here's some basics, uh, and we'll dive into this a little bit later, but when it comes to fundraising, uh, the, the first step in fundraising that people often overlook is know what you're doing and why you're trying to do it. Uh, a lot of times we raise money because we just think we need money, but we have no idea what the money's going to, what, what we're trying to accomplish with it. And having the answer to that question is going to be really helpful in getting people to think you're worth investing in. So the first step in fundraising is know what you're trying to do and why. The second one is know what your budget is. You're not raising an obscure amount of money. You're not just raising, I don't know, let's guess a number. You should have an idea of what you need the money to do and, and what money you don't have so that you can go out and target a goal with your fundraising. And then finally, look also at um, how, who owns the process. A lot of times, and I'm talking about parish youth ministry leaders here, a lot of times the, the weight of that is squarely on the shoulders of the youth ministry leader. They feel like it's their job to pull money from people's pockets, uh, which is illegal in most states. Um, so like that, that's not just you doing this. You can, you can have a whole team of people who are helping with that process as well. So we'll talk about that. Let's dive in. So what you're doing and why. Uh, what is the program you want to fund? Now, program is kind of one of those words that we have to think about, but a program is merely a structure and a strategy. A lot of times we think uh, a program is merely a structure. It's something I have to do. Uh, but there's also a strategy implied in that. What, why are you doing it? What are you hoping to accomplish by your program? And it's really important to own that language, especially with some of these, these processes we're going to see a little bit later for fundraising. What is it you hope your participants will get? So... Um, so for example, there's a difference between saying, I want to take kids to NCYC and back. Okay, that's why I'm raising money. That's what the program is. But if I say, I want to take young people to an experience of church that we can't have here in Iowa with 10,000 or 20,000 peers who are reinforcing their faith that we can't do here in Iowa, I want to sh show them a scope of the universal church that doesn't exist in their parishes here in Iowa. People say that's worth investing in. But a four-day trip out of Iowa and back, as appealing as that is to young people, isn't really worth investing in. So why I'm doing it matters. How will this program benefit the parish or the world? So what's the return on the investment we can advertise? And avoid checking boxes. This is something we do because we've always done it, and now we need the budget to make it work because we've always fundraised. Avoid that. Know your purpose and hit it, okay? Okay. When it comes to setting a budget, here's just a few things to keep in mind with traveling somewhere. So this, this, this whole webinar was like, if you're going somewhere with young people, the budget's going to be probably more extreme than if you're just doing like, we would like to have ice cream after one of our youth nights. Uh, um, so a, a traveling program requires a lot more of a complicated budget than that. There's usually a registration price. There's usually a lodging if it's an overnight, travel expenses, meals sometimes parishes will have the meals be on your own like you have your own cash you buy your own meals sometimes as part of a package um, some parishes try to cover the cost of their chaperones and others ask the chaperones to pay their own way some parishes will fundraise only for young people but not at all for chaperones and some people will fundraise only for chaperones but not for young people it's like that's just weird it's the universal church uh, sometimes that you will include some kind of apparel. If it's NCYC, a goofy hat or trading items or a scarf or a, a t-shirt or, or whatever it is that uh, a fanny packs, whatever it is that you're using to like indicate that this is who you are to celebrate you. Um, sometimes people will also want to include in their budget gratuity. This is something that I've missed from time to time, bus driver tips, housekeeping tips. Um, if we stop at restaurants, uh, tips that way. So like any kind of gratuity that you want to make sure you offer. Um, it's by the way, it's a new thing that you're supposed to give your diocesan and director 10% to I just I just heard that I don't make it up, but it's out there in, in Google. And so anyway, that's, those are the kind of things you might want to look at when putting together a trip budget. You need to start with this, because until you know what the real cost of your program is, 
you don't know how much of this you're going to even need. If the program's affordable, you might not need to do fundraising at all. And if there's benefits of doing fundraising, even if it is totally affordable, we'll get to that in a little bit. So you're going to set your fundraising goal. Now, I, I want this is kind of an interesting point. Don't try to fundraise more than you need. The, the reason I put that in here is because a lot of times we'll measure success by fundraisers merely by the amount of dollars raised. And a fundraiser does more than bring in money. It sells a mission. It builds ownership. It brings young people and their parents and their parish together. So there's more benefits to fundraising than making it only about the money. So don't lose track of that. Um, don't raise 100%. I, I think a lot of times when I've seen programs that like, it's not going to cost you anything to go to this, the engagement from the participants has actually been hurt. So making something affordable for those who have no other means of affording it, I get that, but ask for some kind of contribution if it's $5 or $50 or whatever it is, try not to cover the 100%. Um, you're going to get better engagement. Again, the mission suffers if we just fund the whole thing. So remember, this is all about selling our mission, not just making money. Um, find out what the need is from the people who are going and help that. Uh, be reasonable. Don't like, oh, I'm just gonna go out and raise $15,000 tomorrow. Um, and it'll be happening. And you end up getting $13.50 and the program doesn't happen. So make, make sure you have some projectability to your numbers and your goals. And consider raising money for other people too. Like, I think this is a really kind of a cool concept. This is something we, we did in NCYC uh, with our diocese um, in 2017, 2019, we kind of dabbled with this, is raising money for other dioceses. Um, people who had to travel to come to join us. We thought that was kind of a cool thing to do. It gave our kids a sense of ownership. Like, not only can I pay my way, but I'm going to also kick in $10 or $20 for some other kid who can't otherwise afford to go. Um, that's just kind of a cool thing to get people in. And so stewardship is not just about making it so that we can go, so, but, but so that we can go, the Universal Church. I thought that was kind of a cool concept. Um, build a sense of communal ownership. Like, and we talked about this before, but this is not just your, your burden. Make sure that the, the young people own this, make sure their families have some kind of investment or opportunity to own this. And as much as you can involve the entire parish community so that this isn't just like a youth ministry side gig, but that this is the parish's expression of its mission, um, that's gonna be awesome, right? This is just the basics of fundraising. Um, so let's dive into what this looks like, like for in my situation with, with NCYC, for example. So we ask this question every, every two years. Um, even though I had, what, 1,700 people go to NCYC in 2017 and um, almost 1,000 in 2021, even in the midst of a pandemic, we, every two years we ask the question, why are we doing this? What, what's our purpose? What do we hope NCYC does for our young people and for our parishes? And what we've learned with this program is why is it worth investing in? Why It's a million-dollar program for this diocese for us to go to NCYC. Um, NCYC in, uh, allows us to engage young people at all different kinds of walks of life um, and invite them into something more. For a lot of these kids, it's their first big experience of church. And that's that's something we, again, we can't do that here in Iowa. So that's, that's one of the reasons we do it, is it introduces them to a relationship with Jesus. Now, it's it doesn't complete that. And that's, that's one of the things that we have to keep telling people, like, you can't send a kid to NCYC, and then they're going to come back and be a priest the next day. Like, that doesn't work. But we do open the door for something. It moves them to an openness. So when they come back, the parish has somebody who's receptive to something deeper. The other thing we've seen, and this is kind of cool, is we have a lot of parents who go to share that experience with their kid. And NCYC actually hits our parents more than it hits our kids. So we've seen that in the evaluations. Parents love an encounter with Christ as much as anybody else does. And when those parents come back, they plug into a parish dynamic and they bring that living energy back to the whole faith community. So like we've seen that the energy and enthusiasm we get from NCYC. So that helps me. So when I'm looking at um, asking people for money for this, or when parishes are encouraging people to ask for money, this is what we tell them that we're trying to do. And it's not, it's not hard to see why that's attractive. So we can articulate it. We set our budget. Our budget includes about $650 a person. So just just to put that in a context with whatever your diocese or parish is looking for your, for your trip, whether you're heading out to um, uh, Long Beach or another youth conference or service trip or, or whatever else you're looking at doing, um, that's kind of what our pack package price is for this. One of the things that we include in that package price, by the way, is we have a team of people who go behind the scenes and, and do hall walking at night, 
Um, we provide transportation and medical consultations. We do a lot of things while we're there because of the size of our group, that just seems important. All of that is covered and baked into that price so that as, as a person going, um, we're gonna take care of you, but that costs money and, and we wanna take care of our volunteers too. So that's all kind of written in into that price. So that's it's a pretty extensive budget. Um, a lot of our parishes shoot a goal for about 50%. Now, why do I talk about parishes? Because the Archdiocese doesn't raise money for NCYC. Um, I haven't done that. I haven't had to, S sort of. Okay, the only exception is that in our package price, we include $10 for financial assistance for people in our diocese who don't have any other means of getting financial support. So we do offer financial assistance for people. We collect a big pool of money. And from that, we make a little bit available for some of our own people to go. We also ask for a $10 gift for each participant for traveling dioceses. So we sponsored or we partnered with a couple different dioceses in the past. And it's, it's actually been a real cool partnership uh, for us to be able to mingle with them and share with them and see the Universal Church together at NCYC. So it was was a privilege for us to have done that and uh, it was more beneficial for us I think um, to have the opportunity to share um, and and for them to share their uniqueness with our kids as well so that was pretty pretty cool experience one of my favorite NCYC moments so that's kind of how I, I would imagine fundraising from a basic level for NCYC all right scooting forward here are some of the things I've learned fundraising is not about making money it's about selling your mission I think if we all took that lens, what we do is worth doing and the money's a means, but it's not gonna replace why we're doing it. We're not gonna focus all of our energy on those pro, um, on just the, the fundraising. Something else I've learned is that some, program, um, some programs compete for benefactors. So the parish has so many rich people. And if everybody always asks those people for funds, sometimes they will they will pick one program at the expense of another. So we have to be you know, political and appropriate about who we're asking for help and make sure that we're not doing unintentional damage to, to another aspect of parish ministry. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll see this a lot. Almost a, a lot of the times when, when parishes are, are forming a group to go on a trip, and they have meetings like monthly meetings beforehand, the biggest agenda item on those meetings is fundraising. Instead of formation, instead of getting to know each other, instead of planning for what we're gonna do when we get back. Um, if talking about money is the, the biggest, most important thing on your agenda, you probably shouldn't be doing the trip. So make your conversations, and even if you're talking about fundraising, do it in a way that reemphasizes your mission. As don't spend more time talking about money than our mission. Don't lose sight of the individuals either. This isn't just a, a, a bottom line goal that we're going to raise so much money so that we can raise so much money. You're doing this to help people. And if there's people in your community who can't afford to go, they might have other needs too. So don't, don't forget about the real pastoral care issues of some of the people in your parish and think that you're addressing that just because you're raising some money. Finally, delegate and collaborate. Not finally, I got one more after this. Uh, make sure you're not doing this by yourself and then watch out. This is interesting. There's a lot of people that I've run into who are a little bit upset when we start raising money and helping some kids and not their own. So there are some greedy and entitled people who think that they have a right to your money. Um, so watch out for that. Just be careful about that. We're going to see that a little bit later in some of these examples. So here's your chance to play along, those of you who are joining us at home. Um, Go ahead, find the chat if you can, and just two questions, just and, and just throw it in here. We'll give about, about four or five minutes to this part of the process. But if there's been something that you've seen in your life that has been super successful, type up a sentence or two that just explains that. Um, Jane's going to pick the best and read them out, um, and we're going to take this list and kind of curate it and make it available with the recording of this um, of this webinar. Oh, by the way, Chris, I'm, I'm assuming this will be recorded and that people can watch it later. I'm assuming that's that's kind of a joke. Yes, it will be recorded and available for you later. Um, and then here's another fun one. What has been the biggest frustration with, um, with fundraising? So go ahead and take a few minutes. And Jane, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and read some of these as they're coming along. Uh, um, all one of them so far. Um, that'd be awesome. Happy to do that. Hey. Got some frustrations in here, having to ask for money. 
it feels weird asking for money because they're always asking for money. Here's a unique one, a 365 prayer fundraiser. <clears throat> they asked for donations for dates. January 1st is $1. Oh, December 31st is $365. So I never heard of that before. Um, smoothie bar for those waiting for their cars to be washed, the car wash. Um, adopt a pilgrim, people going on, young people going on a pilgrimage. Um, they sponsor a specific pilgrim. Oh, a local hardware store donated a grill and they raffled it off. Lance said they had a poker tournament. Oh, Ellen said 24 hour rockathon, all teens fundraising, sits in rocking chairs and bond in prayer games and song. That sounds fun. Uh, an auction. So people bringing things in and then auctioning it off. That's nice. Okay. Their best fundraisers have to do with donations of goods rather than money. It's kind of thought provoking. Oh, Danielle said she has their most effective fundraiser is selling luminaries for Christmas Eve math display. That's kind of interesting. So their light would be up, their family light or something. That's sweet. Um, like that. Bottles and cans for redemption at, uh, you know, where you can get some money. That's always good. And it's also recycling. Okay. Leah said they partner with Knights of Columbus for an Italian dinner. The Young people help with the food preparation and the youth performing there. Oh, and Cecilia said they made $7,000 on a flea market. Selling fleas, that's something. Did you see this one from Kelly, though, selling 3,000 pumpkins? That's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Oh, here's a fun sexist competition between men and women who has more sense. That's clever. Play the competition Very game. Hmm. Bake sales, volunteer services in the community. Those are always sweet. Tapping in on Mardi Gras. Oh. Jim Flanagan, are you from the Midwest? Got a cornhole tournament trivia night. I think right now everybody's Googling cornhole, right? Like, I think that's. Bean, bean bag toss, folks. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that helps. Thanks for translating yeah. Midwest to yes. America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's our, our list here. Oh, Boston. What now? Oh, what, Jim? Well, keep them coming. Let, that's that's yeah. this is this is fun, and um, and you can you can. By the way, this is kind of fine with me if you just want to ignore everything I'm saying and look at what everybody's putting in the chat. Like this is this is where our community is. We're taking care of each other. But I just want to I want to dive into real quick. Like here's here's a few different options that are possible. Kind of general categories of fundraising. And, and just to talk through them, there's pros and cons of each of them. So I'm going to do my best to poke at some of them more than I poke at others. So. Um, some of them have been your greatest successes, but I think you're going to recognize some of the frustrations as well. So there's eight of them um, and some fun keywords in here too. So like selling stuff um, is, is quite a common thing. So, so everything from car washes to candy bars to, um, let's see, yeah, so thanks for pointing that out, Michelle. I'll get to the extortion one. Thanks for, thanks for seeing that though, Michelle. Um, so other things that you sell, um, Cool, cool things. Uh, what I what I liked in some of those, what you were selling things that were actually mission related, um, unlike fire extinguishers, suckers, candy bars, and, and car washes. Um, some of you were selling some things that were pertinent to, to the mission um, luminaries. I saw, for example, in some of these chats. So this is a common thing. The the pros of it is it's generally pretty easy. Here's something. Go get someone to buy it. 
Uh, there's ample opportunities for this. There's tons of companies who have catalogs that you can just buy the, or get their catalog, order through them. They'll ship it for you. There's a lot of companies that make a ton of money on you selling their stuff for them. So like, it's easy to find people to do this. The other thing about it is some parishes really want to be able to track individual sales. And so they take the proceeds each individual person generates and attaches that to their individual account. And this is a clean way to do that. Whereas things that are a collaborative, for example, how do you divide up that money? And that just becomes a little bit weird. So the downsides to this, obviously, is that the products are typically more expensive when you're buying them from a fundraiser and only generate a portion of the proceeds to the cause. So I could go to the store and buy a candy bar for a buck, or I can buy it from a fundraiser for two bucks. Well, why don't I just buy a candy bar I want and give the kid a dollar? Right, like so. There's there's ways of doing that. Um, we saw this with my my son selling popcorn for Boy Scouts. People didn't want to spend sixteen dollars on a canister of popcorn, but they just wanted to give him ten bucks. Like, and so anyway, uh, there's some downsides to, to the to the product not being attractive or being too expensive for a consumer. And then sometimes this becomes a competition and almost like a sales training. Now, I, I want to step back and say it really depends on what the mission of the fundraiser is again. So keeping in mind, for example, Girl Scout cookie sales, um, Girl Scouts themselves don't make a ton of money on the cookie sales, but that's not the primary purpose that Girl Scouts started selling cookies. It was about helping girls to have experiences that were going to teach them interpersonal skills, entrepreneurship, business, leadership, management, all of those skills that come with that process. That was an alternative. That was the, the primary objective of doing the cookie sales, as I understand it, of course, with my long history of Girl Scouts, but it was different than making money. So they were going to sacrifice a little bit of proceeds for the sake of having an amazing experience. And, and anyway, that's that's a for what it's worth. That's selling stuff. Now we have selling experiences, which I didn't see as much of, but selling experiences people will do every once in a while, well, they'll, they'll provide us some, some kind of a service that people can pay for. Um, so we'll have kids that go out and like, we will come to your house and decorate your sidewalk if you give us 20 bucks, or we'll come out and mow your lawn for 20 bucks, or we'll come to your house and sing Christmas songs, 20 bucks. All right. So like selling some kind of an experience. Um, and so you can be really creative with, with how, how that goes. Um, the, the, the pros of that, the benefits are that you showcase the gifts of the teens, that you're letting the community see that these kids are contributing members, and that's awesome. It also provides some kind of a positive boost to the community. You can lift the spirits of more than one person. So again, the mission is, is doubled over um, when, when, you're, when you're serving a community and generating funds at the same time. Um, the downsides is this is a little bit harder to track. It's hard to know if it's being done. It's hard to coordinate. The administration is just a little bit goofier. Um, you might be risking some child labor laws. So my lawyer said I had to say that part. Like, I think that's a legitimate concern. You don't know what these people are doing. Um, and so making sure that you have that is a little bit a thing. And it might turn the kids into just like a dog and pony show where, where almost like they're a subject to, to exploit. So i um, not sure that's always great, but again, this is the key things to keep in mind, all right? Um, yeah, pledge drives. This is, we saw a few of these. The Rockathon, by the way, which I thought was about music, it was really about sitting in a rocking chair. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting. So like I've heard of a dance marathon, the pay to pray we heard about the like, we'll pray for 365 days if you give us $365. So like I'm paid to pray, um, right? And, and my favorite that I've never seen anybody do, this is a Kevin Fine original if you want to steal it from me. Lent seems to be all about getting into shape. Like I'm going to fast for 40 days because bikini season's coming up. Okay, not my motive exactly, but Lent can be used as like a way to get off that Christmas and Thanksgiving, you know, the, the pounds that we put on. So rather than use Lent to make me better, what if I sacrifice my body for the sake of raising money? So every day in Lent, I'm going to eat 50% of every meal is going to be ice cream. And how many days can I do it? So can I get $40 from you if I can go all 40 days with eating only ice cream? So you take a pledge to sacrifice your health and your well-being and, and and everything that comes along with eating 50% of ice cream. Again, I've never seen anybody do it, but it'd be kind of a great um, Netflix documentary eventually. All right, so here's the benefits of something like this. It shows the community you're serious. If you're going to have kids sit around and um, do something like praying 
or, or making rosaries or something like that, where they are committing to do a certain amount of product, you're showing the community your kids can step it up. It also builds rapport and trust. We, we heard about that in the Rockathon, playing games and hanging out together. There's a lot of benefits that come from something like this. The downside is that the benefactors are paying for an end result that's not necessarily the program itself. So the mission changed from we're not raising money because we believe in what we're doing. We're making money kind of to see someone endure suffering. And there seems to be a little bit of a, mm, just a, mm, about that. So anyway, but I do like ice cream. Okay, now here's the extortion. This is the one that I think people get excited about. Okay, you know who you are. So have you ever heard about the pink flamingos thing where, where one day you put a pink flamingo in somebody's yard and it's got an envelope on it and says, unless you put $20 in this envelope tomorrow, there's going to be another pink flamingo in your yard. And you keep doing that every day until they finally put $20 in the envelope. Um, we've heard about the prison ransoms where people will be abducted and put in prison and they have to make phone calls to raise a certain amount of money or they can't go. Um, but, but the one I like, again, that I've never seen anybody do is a door-to-door -door sales pitch. And it goes like this. Hi, my name is Kevin from the Archdiocese of Dubuque, and I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. But if you pay me $20, I'll leave right now. Like, I think that would do one of two things. Either I'm going to get 20 bucks or I'm going to be able to talk to somebody about Jesus. Like either way, it's a win, right? But that seems kind of like extortion. Okay, so the pros are, yeah, might be effective and you're going to get talk. People are going to buzz about this. It might build some excitement. It also might build some, uh, some legal complaints. Anyway, cons is you're setting aside the mission merely to raise funds. Um, there's insults and assaults and oh yeah kidnapping and trespassing so like all of the uh all of the rules you break just to make that happen anyway the, anyway things to keep in mind okay this is something people said in the chat too it's like the best fundraiser is straight out asking um and this looks like as somebody from the pulpit saying look we need some money we're gonna have a second collection um, my parish does something called a red envelope campaign where they, they simply put out a whole bunch of envelopes and the outside of the envelope is a dollar amount. You just pick the envelope that matches your willingness and you put money in it and you return it to the parish office. I mean, it's, it's like the hardest administration ever. You just like collect money. Um, I had a coworker just the other day who was trying to raise money for, for a, a youth trip we're doing. Um, and the person said, um, well, my goal is to is to make this affordable for people, and I'll do all the fundraising. And another member of that parish said, by fundraising, he means he's just going to ask people for money, as if somehow that wasn't a legitimate way to go about it. Uh, the point here is that um, if you what you're doing is worth doing, and people are attracted to that mission, they'll fund it. They'll fund it, and you don't have to stray far from your mission to make money that way. So here's some of the pros about this. There's no gimmicks. It's really easy. And it puts the mission front and center. You're not pretending to be something else. You are legitimately about bringing young people to Christ. And if people want to support that, they can do so. And if that's not their thing, move on. But, but you're true to who you are. The downside is that you're dependent on people who believe in the mission. And sometimes that's, that's despairing because you might run into a few people like, I don't want to do that, but I'll buy a fire extinguisher or I need my car washed or whatever. We're getting there, Michelle. We're getting there. Okay, so competing with other parish needs. Now, sponsorships um, is another way to go. Finding a few patrons who can underwrite specific costs. Um, will you get 5,000 to cover transportation, for example? The pros here is it can be real big money. You can might maybe get a few corporate sponsors who will underwrite a specific aspect of your program. Um, and if you do a targeted ask, that seems like it's really palatable for a lot of people. And then some businesses get the chance of doing some visibility with that. Like maybe they get to put uh, their logo on your, your, your t-shirt or, or your promotional brochure or whatever it is. Um, downside is sometimes it's hard to find sponsors. This is a little bit of work. You got to make some phone calls. Um, Put, putting ads on your program stuff can be a bit distracting. Um, it just, it's just kind of a fun thing. looks a bit more corporate than church. Like I like to think if our churches did this, would then when father comes out, when this chasuble look like a NASCAR like vehicle with like ads all over it, like this mass brought to you by PepsiCo. Like, and like, it just seems like it can get a little bit, a little bit sleazy almost if, if we did that too much. So there's an image there of how much are we selling out uh, to sponsors, but depends again, if the sponsors aligned with your mission, um, we want to celebrate that. Just look at the back of parish bulletins, right? Like a sponsorship's a part of what we do as church. So you might be able to find a way to make that work for you in a, in a palatable way. 
selling stock is this this is people who've heard about this love this one it's it's something that i think is pretty cool so you can sell stock and you can put a price point on that if you want to like a, when i was in parish ministry a certificate of stock was 10 bucks but man inflation hit and the market's been on a ride so now now that stock's up to 25 dollars put a price to it if you want to or just say look we'd like you to invest in our young people and don't put a price on it but I, but i love this concept of what does a shareholder get what does a shareholder get when they invest in your young people? So there's a couple of different things. One is they own the program. They just get to know that they made this happen and that's them living out their baptismal call. But another thing you can do is you can just a couple of ways to celebrate that. Like some parishes hold stockholder suppers that when they get back from the event, they do the slideshow um, and the kids tell their story about how they were benefited and they serve a, a really cheap, easy meal. Usually it's spaghetti or grilled cheese or mac and cheese or something like that. Um, the other thing is you can do is have your kids write thank you notes from the trip on postcards and mail them from the destination uh, so your stockholders see that there's a gratitude in your young people. Um, that's a good way to generate funds. So the pros focused on the investment of your program, uh, um, allows parishioners to own it, uh, keeps the mission front and center, and allows for continued follow-up and engagement. Um, that's kind of cool too. If you have a list of people who bought your stuff and have your, you have their name and number, now you've got somebody who believes in your mission and you have their name and their number. Isn't that cool? So think about that. What could you do? Downsides. There's a little bit of work on the follow through and the setup and the administration of this, but the hardest thing I've ever ran into was that teens don't know how to write a thank you note. So like, that's something we can do. We can teach young people a life skill. All right, so that's some of the downsides. Now I wanna brace you for this one. I talked about this one every time I talk about fundraising and everybody looks at me like I have three heads, okay? And I don't for the record, just, just, just the one. Um, this is from Acts chapter two, and most of you, because you're good Catholics, you already know what it means. I don't have to put the, put the translation up there, do I? Um, all right. So all who believe were together and had all things in common. See where this is going? They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each's need. Okay. Here's what I mean. Let's say you have 10 people going on a youth trip. The price for each person is 550 bucks. Okay, so wherever. You can either have each person raise $550 or tell the group, look, the 10 of us have to raise $5,500. And this is assuming, by the way, just for example, that we're raising 100%, which I told you not to do earlier if you were listening. But here's the example. And this is a different mindset. Like, are you all about you raising your $550 or are we really in this together? Are we a team? Are we a community? Are we a parish? Are we a church that's trying to take care of one another? Like that's kind of important. Here's how it works. So bear with me on this. Um, people find this weird. So each month, let's say, the 10 teens, uh, 10 teens who are going seek donations from selling stock or another means. Uh, that, that's important. Like this is however you collect the money or raise the money doesn't necessarily matter in this model. We had one girl, we were literally selling suckers, 50 cents a piece. We paid a quarter for them. That girl sold enough suckers for two other kids to go on, on our trip. So she, she raised all $500 for herself and then she raised another $1,000 selling suckers. This kid was nuts though. All right. Anyway, don't, don't run into her if you've got cash. She will, she will just take it from you and give you like 83 suckers. All right. All funds go towards the group. So everything that's raised goes towards the whole, not to the individual. So let's say for this example that every month we raise about $500. Again, whatever means we're using to do that. Every month for five months, the kids are asked to make a $100 payment. Okay, we're getting close to the 550 if we do that, just, just for this hypothetical. In the first month, there's $500 in the kitty, in the, in the communal pool that can be shared. So when they come forward, um, you would say to them, look, you owe us $100. If you'd like to, you can use $50 that we've collected for the whole group. If you need to take that $50, it's yours. Um, if you can pay the whole $100 though, that means somebody else can use that fundraised money. So how, do you wanna take the $50 or a portion of it or do you wanna pay the whole thing? When, when, when we tried this, we saw that the families who had a legitimate need very humbly took the money. And those families who were well off were very thrilled to be able to gift that to a member of our team. Um, most people 
just paid the full amount, $100, and let that money ride. In this example, let's assume that 50% of the teens take it, the other 50 don't, and that leaves $250 in the group fund. So we raise another $500, a $750 in the fund, and the next month you say, you go $100, would you like to use $75, a portion of that, or do you want to pay the whole $100? Um, see, see how this is going? And so the ones who need, take. The ones who don't need, don't. And assuming that only half, that leaves $375 in the fund, and it keeps going the next month. Now we have $88 of that $100 can be matched, and so on. In the end, those who could afford the whole 550 would pay the whole 550 and know that doing so is a gift to their classmates. Those who couldn't afford it would only have paid about $100 out of the pocket. Now that's the magic of this. The money goes to those who need it most. And everyone played a role in helping the least of these. That should sound familiar. Like I've heard that somewhere. Okay. So that's the Acts 2 44 45 model. The pros, the benefits of this fundraising becomes a collective challenge that we embrace together as a group. It allows for those who are not able uh, to pay as much to benefit from those who can. And it allows for a radical introduction to the interdependency of being church, which I think is kind of a lesson that we can teach over and over and over and over again, that we're in this together. I don't have to like you, but I do have to love you. And like, that's the Christian message here we are. This is what a church does when we mean it. Downsides. Okay, you can probably list these more than I could. It requires deliberate catechesis and buy-in. If you're using this for like an introduction church, uh, trip or, or something like what we would Francie Weiss, and you got kids who are coming from all over um, who've never had a church experience before in their life, this might not sell well. But if you're trying to take kids to like a leadership retreat and you're doing a cream of the crop from your kids, like this would be a catechetically appropriate thing, a message to challenge them to. You're going to hear from people, this just isn't fair. This just isn't fair. And interestingly, the people you hear that from are the families who have the money. Like that's what's interesting. That's what's interesting. Why should I raise money for that person? And it becomes a little bit of condescending and us versus them. And there's a little bit of problems with that. Okay, and this is this is just the reality of when you have money involved in a program. And these teachings are hard to accept, Jesus said in John 6, 60, talking about something else. But I think Jesus would also say, and I think we would agree that these this is hard. This this whole idea of if I have more money, therefore I have more responsibility. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to communicate to people who are looking for um, purely, purely equal. All right. So wrapping this whole thing up, um, some reminders about fundraising. What's your mission? What's your objective? What are you trying to do? Set your budget, do the math. Most people get into youth ministry do so with a graduate degree from MIT who are awesome at like financial literacy. Um, so budget writing is, is something we do just for fun. But anyway, I'm kidding. This is hard work for a lot of us. So like putting together a budget, uh, make sure you spell out what your expected costs are and then set your fundraising goal and then don't do it alone. All right. Thus ends the wisdom of Kevin. Like that's all really I have to offer about anything. So um, let's go throw in some questions, comments and Jane, I'll let you kind of coordinate this part moving forward. Well, I just want to make one comment first that um, when you were describing that last type of fundraising, it made me think of a mentor of mine, somebody who accompanied me as a youth minister. And he always said that everything we do as church has the potential to teach. So even fundraising, even that has a way of teaching us how to do it well, how to do it right, how to do it ethically and morally you know, beautiful and something that will grow the church. So that's been really wonderful. Um, so we've got some comments here that um, this was very, very helpful, and um, they like your sense of humor, so there's some of those comments on there. Um, but um, one of the questions that we had is someone asked, is there a certain time of the year that's the best time to fundraise, or is it as needed? What's your take on that? hate when you beat yourself when you can't find the enemy button. Um, I don't, I don't have any wisdom on that. Like I, um, 
Oh, I, I don't know. I could, I could make some guests, but uh, guests, but I don't, I don't, I don't like tax return season. Probably <laughs> not Christmas. Maybe Christmas because that's when everybody feels charitable. Like I don't know Valentine's Day because everybody's spending money on things anyway. Or I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Probably not Father's Day. We're all busy. Um, I, I, I have, I have no wisdom. Any that's a, that's a great question. Like if the rest of the group has any insight on that, have, have you tried something that worked sometime a year and not in the other? Um, when the people are gathered, when probably maybe do you avoid summer or do you try summer? Like, I, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, you know, it made me think when I saw that question early on, it made me think that your philosophy of fundraising is really like, we're not going to ask for more than we need. So yeah. I wonder if, you know, just looking back on my own experiences, when we have things coming up, if people know that youth ministry calendar and they can see that or you publish it or communicate it, that people know when things are happening. And so they're not going to be surprised that the young people are going to do a mission trip in the summer or they're having a weekend retreat and they need, you know, something. So maybe it's connected to some of that, the communication. And, um, but I almost think you have to do it all year round at some time, mm. you know, when you've got things going on, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Someone said it, things all different, you know, at different times of the year, like baskets of flowers or, you know, for the weekend of mother's day or wreaths at Christmas. So those are kind of, you have to do them at the right time. I love the comment from Brenda too. Brenda's brilliant. Brenda's one of the smart ones in our diocese. Hey, there's, only, there's only three of them and she's one of them. Um, but to communicate with the school so you're not competing with other people at fundraising time. Like, I just think that's really brilliant and deliberate because um, you don't want to you know, sacrifice their success with, you know, with your own or vice versa. So that's great, Brenda. Good thinking. Yeah, that's very kind. Yeah, that's good. Um. There you go. How do you document the funds coming into your parish are fundraised for a specific purpose and need to be used for that purpose? Yeah. That's, that's a good one for you there. Oh, how do you document the funds that come into your parish are fundraised for? Okay, because so that's um that's a that's a great question. Um I would say each each diocese probably has or, or each parish has a different financial practice on accounting for that. Um I I know that I know what our answer would be in the Archdiocese of Dubuque, but I don't want to presume that that's constant everywhere. So I would say that's a great question for a parish bookkeeper or a diocesan finance office um, to find out what kind of directive they have on that. Um, I like the idea of people give for a specific purpose. You definitely want to honor that intent. Right, for sure. Um, and Barb, so coordinate with the Finance Council. And and if if you have a Knights of Columbus that's you know active and involved that closely, those are good things too. Um, yeah, spreadsheets, <laughs> but I, I, that doesn't help. I, you made me laugh when you said, yeah, we all love money and, you know, we have MIT uh, degrees in youth ministry, but um, there's always someone that will help you too. I feel like there's a parent um, or a volunteer that you could have come and help you take care of that stuff. Too. You know, what's even weirder is there's people who like doing it. I know. Like, and, it, and that's just, and that's, again, one of those things, the more we can do is parish empowerment in general, just in youth ministry, the more we can bring people into own and share this mission with us, the better we're going to be in so many ways, but the quality is better. And it's not, and it's more stress-free from you. Um, <laughs> I'm not naming names here, Michelle. Yeah, call me later. We'll talk. You know who they are. All right. Um, good, good job, everyone. Yeah, this was really good. And um, as a person who's fundraised, had to fundraise so many, many, many times, um, it was really helpful. And I love the fact that you've, you know, really brought in the scripture about that, like why we do what we do and how it should look and how we should share that money. And the that fundraiser at the end that you shared was, it's a challenging one. And I feel like it's something to aspire to um, because it, it teaches us how to be church and how to be there for one another. It's really beautiful. Anybody have any thoughts on that one? Or if they do that themselves, we'd love to hear. Maria, we could. Any final words, Kevin, of support or any kind of thing before we do our final? I, again, I, I just think that this is like, like you said before, that this is, is con absolutely consistent with our mission if it's a catechetical moment. Um, yeah. the joy you see on young people's faces when they own the process and the product and they do it charitably. Um, I've seen the difference between charity and raising money and selfishness and greed and raising money is absolutely definable. 
Uh, and, and I've seen too many times where fundraising becomes a competition and cutthroat and all about me, me, me. And that's just, I, it's ugly. That's just ugly. And, and so I've seen it be beautiful. And once, once you imagine that concept of fundraising as living out our mission rather than competing with our mission, I, I just, it's, hard, it's hard for me to imagine another way of approaching it. So it's messier, it's harder, but, but ministry done well is messy and hard. So whatever you do, try to find a way to incorporate your mission into your fundraising. Make sure your fundraising is not front and center but is surrounded by the mission of the, of the parish and, and the young people. So, all right, that's, that's, that's all I've got to add there. Um, really important to keep that in mind. Thanks. There is a question here, and I know this comes up from, a, I've heard it a lot of times. Do you track the people who help at the fundraisers versus those who never help? And they're still going on the, the trip or doing the event. Yeah, that's that's a tension one, right? That's that's because uh, people, there's people who just want to be a passenger. And, and not a contributor. And it's, what do we do for those people? Like that's, that's a legitimate question and there's no easy answer to that one. Uh, that wouldn't really work in this acts one and, unless, unless they were so prohibited because of family situation, right? Like there's, there's, there's certainly situations where that could be pastorally explained, uh, but some people just, no, I'm gonna go, you make money for me and I'm gonna take advantage of it. The entitlement, that was one of the things I said, let's watch out for that right away at the beginning. You're gonna have people who think that your money's theirs. And um, I don't know how you navigate that. I mean, it, it, but it is messy. I think there should be some buy-in, obviously, if, if whatever people are capable of. Um, so that's when you have to figure out your own local situation yeah. as part of your whole strategy. But, but have a plan for that beforehand. Um, so it's hard to balance those out. Well, Barb's got a great idea here. She said, I have the group establish that policy at the beginning of the process. Then there's buy-in from everybody and they understand it. I think that's beautiful because, you know, if they just, if they determine it, if the young people do, then you'll stick with it. And they can learn along the way if they have to adjust or change their minds or say, well, this is really unfair because of this situation or that. But that's a great learning if you do it that way. So it's beautiful. Okay. So thank you so much, Kevin. I just want to say thank you. This was fabulous. And for all of, who, of you who attended today, wow, this is some great information. And um, I did find out during the webinar today that everyone will receive the recording, not just the members and the curated chat box too, so that you'll be able to have that and to share that um, with your volunteers, your core teams and all sorts of people. So thank you for that, NFCYM. Thank you, Chris, for that. So Kevin, uh, it's just wonderful to be with you today and to enjoy your sense of humor. I just forgot how dang funny you are. And um, it was a lot of fun today. Um, thank you for the over 125 people that came today and hope that you continue to share this information with those that you work with. So um, you'll all be able to receive this and look at that after this. It will come to you from Chris or from NFCYM shortly. And as we conclude, I just want to, to encourage people to come to these webinars, uh, to uh, the things that NFCYM offers. I tell you that it is your community of support, of you know, information, of affirmation. It's just a great community to belong to. So if you aren't a member, um, please consider becoming one because there's so many benefits from that. And the first one that strikes me is friendship and people who think like you, dream like you, and love young people like you. And it's a great community to be involved. And then finally, um, NFCYM members, we've invited you to join us um, on Monday, June 6th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, there's going to be a member meetup on rest, relaxation, and self-care. And I don't know, but most of us need that right now. So join us for some games. Of course, we have to do that. And some wisdom um, sharing on all those topics uh, related to self-care and uh, taking care of ourselves, along with all that wisdom that will be shared. So members will receive the link to join the meetup uh, in their emails, and that will happen the week of the event. So we would love to have you join in on that. I am sure that all of us, as we're winding down, could really use a little bit of that TLC. So thanks again on behalf of NFCYM and on behalf of our webinar committee and um, all those who belong to NFCYM. Glad you joined us and continue to support this amazing organization. Kevin, thank you again, and God bless you all. Take care. <laughs>